Turn your Bibles to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We've been doing a series of messages on our identity, who we are as a church. And we've talked about our purpose as a church. We've talked about our church theme verse, Acts 17, 11. And now we've been talking about our 10 value statements. These are the values that we live by as a church, and we hope that you will live by in your life as well. And since tomorrow is Valentine's Day, I thought I'd skip over to the one about love. And it says that unconditional love. We will nurture an atmosphere of love for God and acceptance in Christ for all men. 1 John 4, 10 and 11, here is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And so I want to talk about how can you love one another in your marriage, in your family, in your relationships at work, in your neighborhood, and especially here at church as well. How do we love one another? And so we're going to take a look at that. I can use some illustrations. A couple of these illustrations I've used before, not too long back, but they're so powerful I wanted to use them again. And to just illustrate this idea of love. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, the Bible says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to the opening of your word. We pray that you can fill us with your love so that we can love others as well. And so help us to understand this concept today of how to love. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The phrase one, the words one and another are used in 325 different verses in the Bible. The phrase one another is used 54 times. The phrase one blank another, like one to another or one with another or one of another is used 290 times. And then specifically, this phrase is used 37 times, love one another, love one another. We are to be known by our love. The world, the people around us should say they're Christians because of their love for God and their love for others, a a unique, special love. Turn over to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, and I want to look at verses 11 through 12. 1 John chapter 4 and verses 11 through 12. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And so we need to love one another. Because God loves us, we can also love others. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And so you say, well, pastor, how can I love others? In your relationship as a husband and wife, with your relationship with your family and friends, How do you love one another? Sometimes the problem is is we try to love each other. It's kind of like this sponge. And no matter how hard I squeeze this sponge, uh, nothing's going to come out of it because there's nothing in it. But if I take the sponge and I put it, I saturate it with the water and put it into the water, then when I take that sponge out, squeeze it, there's all kinds of water that comes out. And that's exactly what God wants, is if we're going to love others, the more we're filled with the love of Jesus Christ, then the more love we have to give. We don't have to strain. We don't have to work at it. I got to love my wife. I got to love my husband. I got to love my family. We don't have to do that because it just naturally comes out, even without squeezing, and just a little bit of squeezing, there's all that love. And so the more I'm filled with the love of Jesus Christ, the more love I have to give. Now, in my relationship with my wife, if I try to generate love towards her, that may work for a little bit, but it's not going to last. But if I realize the way to love my wife is to love God more, and the more I'm filled with the love of God, the more I can love others as well. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 18, and be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so God wants us filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, the way to be filled with the Spirit is that I think there's three things that we can do in order to fill our lives with the Holy Spirit, to fill our lives with the love of God. And the first one is, is that we need, to, we need fellowship. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verses 25 through, uh, 23 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as to see the day approaching. You see, the first thing we need is we need fellowship. I find that when I'm around people that love God, I leave with more of the love of God. And, and that fellowship and that accountability helps me to have love in my life. Now with COVID, we've struggled with this because we've not been able to get together like we, we want to. And that's why I wanna encourage you now that COVID is starting to settle in and, and we're gonna to have to learn to live with this, it, it's really important for us to be together and, and helping one another, filling one another with that love of God. Because when I'm around somebody that loves God, it makes me love God and to love others better. And then secondly, in Psalms 119, verse 11, the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And when I have a love for God's word, when I read it, I study it, I memorize it, I meditate upon it, the more I'm filled with the word of God, the more of the love of God is gonna be in my life. And so it's important to hear the preaching and teaching. It's important for me to be reading my Bible and memorizing scripture and hiding it in my heart. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray without ceasing. And I have found that one of the ways that I can love others better is to pray for them. As you know, I have a prayer list. It's a prayer app called Prayer Mate. And uh, you can download that app. And, and it's got different lists that I have. And pretty well, everybody in the church is on one of those lists. I, as best as I can tell, everybody's on one of those lists. And I pray for you, usually within a week time or somewhere in there, at least once. Some of you are more often because you need it. And uh, others are not. But I, I pray for you. You know what I found since I've been doing that list? Is it's, it's changed my relationship with people. Because now praying for them, there's more of the love of God. And, and there's nothing that's better than walking up to somebody and saying, you know what, I prayed for you yesterday, or I prayed for you this week. And, and, and when you pray for people, it just fills you with that love for one another as well. And so we need to be saturated with the love of God. Now turn over to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and look at verses 7 through 12. John chapter 15, and verses 7 through 12. It says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Look down at verse number 17. These things I command that you love one another. You see, it's abiding in his love. Uh, the thing is, is not just on Sundays, but every day of the week, we need to be like this sponge. We're always in the love of God. And that way, when there's a problem, my wife or my children, if there's a situation at work or whatever else might happen, then I once again can have that love there. Instead of being like this, where we're outside the love of God, and if we need love, we gotta go back. Don't do that, abide in his love. Stay in his love on a daily basis. And then whenever you need it, it's just there for you. It's ready to be used by God and in your life. And so we need to abide in the love of God. And we need to increase our love. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do towards you. To this end, we may, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I, um, and then 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. No matter how well you're doing, whether it's in your marriage, your family, wherever it is, you can do better. This church is a church that's known for its love. 
One of the comments we get over and over again is how loving and how caring the people were when, when they visited the church. And I'm thankful for that. But you know what? We can always do better. I love my wife, but I can do better. And, and we need to be increasing in our love, never satisfied, never really feeling like I, I've accomplished this, but to continue working in those areas. What I need is I need a heart that's filled with love. Go back to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and look at verses 7 through 11. 1 John chapter 4, and beginning with verse number 7. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You see, God wants us to be filled with his love. Now, in order to do that, you've got to know the love of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, it says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, you cannot be filled with what you don't have. And you have to have God's love through his son, Jesus Christ, in your heart and life. You've got to have Jesus Christ as your personal savior. The reason we need Christ is because we have hearts that are full of sin. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, say to the Lord. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, what we need to understand is that you and I, we are full of sin. It's like taking this sponge here and putting it in this. It's just filled with all of that, that darkness and all that sin. And, and we've got to get rid of that sin. And how do we get rid of that sin? Is what we've got to do is we've got to have Christ as the one and the only one that can cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we can come out clean in Jesus Christ. And so we need him to take away the sin. The Bible tells us in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we need the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who died for us upon the cross, to cleanse us. In Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's, it's God's love and the Holy Spirit comes in and he takes away our sins and he gives us eternal life if we trust him as our Savior. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so you've got to know God's love. You've got to know Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 9, it says, And this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart and your life? Do you have him as your savior? Have you received the love of God through sending his son to die upon the cross for you to save you from your sins? You see, you cannot be filled with what you don't have. And you have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to have Jesus Christ as your savior. You have to ask him to come into your heart and life. In Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God is raised in the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you have him in your heart and your life? You've got to have the love of God in order to give that love to others as well. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, and I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ornaments, ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. See, a lot of us, our problem is, is our hearts have hardened. 
And because we have a hard heart, we're like this rock right here. And no matter how long I leave that rock in the water, when I take it out, there's going to be a few drips of water, but you can't squeeze anything out of that. And some of you, what you've gotten, you've gotten to that point, you've hardened your heart so much against your spouse or against your family or against your coworkers, whoever else might be, you've gotten so hard that you cannot no longer be soaked up with that love of God. And you've got to have a tender heart, a heart that is willing to be soaked and filled with the love of God. In 1 Peter 1, the Bible says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. There's two key words in that verse that I want you to understand. First one is the word unfeigned. It says, uh, it says that you have uh, uh, through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. The idea of this word unfeigned is, is, is it's got to be real. It's got to be the love that God wants us to have in our lives. Not a, not a fake love, not something that's made up, but something that's real from our hearts. In Romans 12, 9 and 10, the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. Now, the word dissimulation means without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another with brother love, in honor preferring one another. Now, there's three different words for love in the Greek language that are used in this verse. And the first one is when it says that we are to, um, uh, to let love be without dissimulation. That word love is the word agape. Now you're familiar with agape, right? That's the word in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Agape love is a giving love. It's not a taking love. It's a giving love. I want to give of myself. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, it says, but God commendeth or showed his love towards us. In that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So agape love is a love that's based upon the character of the one doing the loving, not the one being loved. He loved us while we were yet sinners. So it's not that we deserved his love. He loved us because he's a God of love. And so we need to have that agape love, a love that is not based upon, well, you, what you did for me. It's a, it's a giving love. It's a, it's, a, it's a love that is based upon the character of the one doing the loving. But it says, let love be without dissimulation, Abhor that which is evil, evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another. Now that phrase, kindly affection, it comes from another root word in the Greek, storge. And storge is a family love. It's a love based upon your familiar relationship. It's a, you, you love your kids because they're your kids. You love your parents because they're their, your parents. You love your brothers and sisters because you're related to them. And so it's a, it's a, a relational love based upon uh, family ties. And, you know, I'm thankful for my family. And I love my mom. She's passed away now. And I love my brothers and sisters. And they're all spread out in the mainland. And, and, uh, and I'm thankful for that love that we can have one towards another. And, and I know that they love me. We're, we're not as connected as we should be sometimes. And we're not as close as what I'd like us to be, both distance-wise and emotionally wise, but I do know that my family loves me. My brother, he's five years older than I am, and I knew when I was growing up, he loved me very much. He loved to tease me. He loved to hit me. He loved to harass me. Uh, he loved me very, very much. But you know, sometimes there's ties that are stronger than even those family ties. It's Ohana. I'm closer to many people in this room than I am to my own family because we're related through our Heavenly Father. We have that family relationship. And you know, you don't get to choose your family, but you still need to love your family. And then the third word in this passage, it says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. And that phrase brotherly love, it comes from the Greek word phileo, where we get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it's not a, a brother and sister kind of love relationship. The word is a, it means a responsive love. Phileo is there's a reason for me to love you. Now, those of you that are married in this room, when you first met your spouse, you, the, the girl or the guy, when you first met them, there was something about them that you responded to. You looked at them and said, wow, they're good looking. You got to know them a little bit and said, wow, they're fun to be with. And there's something that caused you to respond towards them. And because of that, you fell in love with them. 
Now, the challenge with that is what's great to date is not always great to mate. You know, some of the things we fall in love with in dating, I think we have to live with in marriage and it's not always the same or we change. And, and so sometimes those responses change, don't they? We don't feel the same thing we did back then. But we're to respond in love towards one another. And, and so the Bible talks about this idea of unfeigned love. It's, it's love that comes from the heart. And that's the kind of love that's willing to forgive. Go over to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter 3, and look at verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 3, and verses 12 through 14. Colossians 3 and verse 12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Now notice, he says, Because you're loved of God, put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. So what he's saying here is if you're going to love, you've got to be willing to forgive. God forgave us of our sins because of his love for us. And so love that's an unfeigned love has to be a forgiving love. Some of you are holding on to bitterness and you're holding on to anger and you're not forgiving. And that's not love. And then it also has to, love is willing to cover a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, And above all these things, have fervent charity or love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. What that means is in those relationships, we don't focus on what's wrong or what's bad. We focus on what's good. You got to focus on what's good. It doesn't mean you don't deal with the problems. If there's a problem, you've got to deal with it but you deal with it with an attitude of forgiveness. You deal with it with an attitude of love and, and not focusing on where the problem is, but focus on how can we make this better. It says that we're to love one another with an unfeigned love and to love one another with a pure heart fervently. The word fervent means to boil over, to boil over. My wife is on the mainland, and so I've been doing the cooking for myself. And the other day I was boiling some water because I wanted to cook some pasta. Be honest with you, it's Kraft macaroni and cheese, but it's still the same thing, right? And, and so I put the water, the pot on the, on the stove, and I turned the stove on, and I, I went off to do something else, and I forgot about it. You ever done that? And then all of a sudden, I started hearing the lid rattling, and I started hearing, tss, 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 and the water's boiling over, hitting the burner. And I ran back in the kitchen. It was, it was fervently boiling over. And that's the kind of love that God wants us to have, a fervent love. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That boiling over, that, that desire to say, I want this kind of love. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God, then God's going to produce his fruit in your life, which is love, joy, peace, long suffering gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. Now, some of you have been around for a while. You've heard me preach on the fruit of Spirit. Maybe you've read the book I wrote on the fruit of Spirit. And in that book and in that message, that series, I, I used a fruit to illustrate each of the fruit of the Spirit. So for the fruit of, for love, what I'd used is a peach. And the reason I chose a peach is a peach on the outside is soft and sweet and fuzzy. But sooner or later, you're going to hit the pits. And the real test of love is not when everything is like the Hallmark card and soft and sweet and fuzzy. The real test is what do I do when we hit the pits in the relationship? But then, I, then the second one, love, joy. And I believe God chose this order for a reason because love and joy go together. Now, for joy, what I chose for joy was a lemon. And the reason I chose a lemon is when you bite into a lemon, you get a very sour look on your face, the opposite of joy. But I also chose it because when I think of lemon and joy together, I think of lemon joy dishwashing soap. And it's just it's a great illustration of what joy is. You see, happiness is no dirty dishes. My wife is gone and I'm not only cooking, but I'm washing the dishes. And one of the things I hate is to walk in the kitchen and see all these dirty dishes stacked up. So I've been really working hard to keep the dishes clean as I use them. And uh, 
But you know, when you, when you have no dirty dishes, you're happy about that. But when you have a sink full of dirty dishes, add the joy and it makes the job easier. So joy is what you add to the problems of life to make them easier to deal with. And, and so when I'm trying to love somebody, when the joy, when the, the problems come, that's when I need to add the joy. The joy is what makes a difference. In Philemon chapter one, verse seven, it says, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So that love and joy go together. Go to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. And look at verses one through five. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look, not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I want to give you another illustration, and you're going to be able to see this better on the screen with this as well. But, you know, I'm going to take some pepper and just sprinkle it in the water here. And in life, we just get all these little problems that come up. And we try to deal with those, and you know, stick your finger in there, and nothing happens. But if I take the Joy dishwashing soap, and I put a little bit on my finger, and put it in the thing, all of a sudden, it just disappears. All the problems go away. And, and that's what we need to understand, is that when you add the joy... See, a lot of us, all right, I'll love. Yeah, I'll, I'll act in love. No, you need the joy of the Lord. And when we add the joy to our love, it just kind of makes all those problems just go away. And so we need to have love and joy together. Now, I want to look at two different passages and we'll close. Go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Look at verses 27 through 38. A little bit long passage, but stay with me on this, all right? Luke chapter 6 and verse number 27. But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. So we're not just talking about loving your spouse or loving your children or loving your neighbors and, and people like that. It's even loving your enemies. Verse number 28, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that ask of thee, and of him that ask, uh, taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love si those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. And if, I, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what they have you, for sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your, your enemies and do good, and lend hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you should not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that you met with all shall be measured to you again. We're to be known by our love. But the truth is, folks, an unsafe person can love someone who loves them. An ungodly person can be kind to someone who's kind to them. Anybody can give to those who are given to them. But it takes the love of God to love someone who's not loving you. To be kind to somebody who's not kind to you. To give when you're not getting. And the only way to do that is to be saturated with God's love. And when you're full of God's love, you just can't help but love. It's overflowing. And every time, go back to the love of God. See, I, I want you to work on your relationships. I teach a marriage class on Thursday night. They watch a video series. I, I taught a marriage, and then we talk about it on Zoom on Thursday night. And I, and I want these couples to work on their marriage. But the reality is, it's got to be first on the Lord. Because when you're full of the love of God, you, it's easy to love your wife. It's easy to love your husband. 
It's easy to love others. And we need to be filled with the love of Jesus Christ. I want to close by going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A lot of you are familiar with this chapter. It's often called the love chapter. In verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains and have not charity or again love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit nothing. Folks, without love and without the love of God in our lives, nothing's going to happen. It's got to be the love of God. We've got to be saturated with that love. Years and years ago, I remember hearing a preacher preach on 1 Corinthians 13. and I don't remember his name or who it was, but I do remember a statement that he made. He said, listen, if you really want to understand 1 Corinthians 13, then take out the word charity and put your name in there instead. Take out the word charity and put your name in there instead. So Wayne suffered long. Wayne is kind. And ask yourself, is that true about me? Because if you're doing these things, then you're loving others like you ought to. So I want to end this message today by us reading these verses, verses 4 through verse number 8. We'll read the first phrase there, charity never fail. And I want us to read it out loud. And I want you to read it out loud and clear. And I want you to read your name wherever it says charity or wherever it begins a new thought there as well. So you follow along with me. I'll do my name, but you do your name. And as you read it, think about it. In my marriage, do I do these things? In my relation with my family, with my friends, with people around me, is this true in my life? So follow along here as we read verse number four through verse, the first part of verse number eight. Wayne suffers long and is kind. Wayne and Vietnam. Read with me. Wayne vaunted not himself, is not puffed up. Wayne does not behave himself unseemly. He seeketh not his own is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Wayne rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Believeth all, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now this is where it stops. Wayne does fail, but love doesn't. I failed my wife. I failed my family. I failed others, but God, never fails. And that's why I need to be filled with the love of God. Because God love, God's love never fails. Let's bow in prayer.